All right, buddy, in today's video, we're going to have a little bit of a twist on our normal subscriber gameplay breakdowns, and I'm going to see if you guys want to add this as part of the series. Very often when I do these types of breakdowns, I'm usually looking at average to below average players, maybe getting their first win or making it into the top five. A lot of times people do submit me a little bit higher kill gameplays, so I'm going to take one of the subscriber submitted gameplays that's definitely high skilled, high KD, and they play aggressive, and we're going to kind of try and learn what we can from their particular play style. Style. And like I said, I normally get a lot of these. So if you guys would like to see more of this type of gameplay broken down on the channel, definitely make sure you hit the like button. Go on today's video is 2,500 likes. If you're brand new, want to find your way back for more Call of Duty content, just make sure you're subscribed with notifications on. Let's get into the breakdown. So the first thing we're going to take a look at is them landing at super. This tends to be a very hot drop area, not necessarily where you need to land if you're trying to get high kills. But generally, when you land at super, it's going to be highly contested and it's going to allow you to get in, in gunfights right away. Especially if you're playing in duos. This particular case, they're playing low man duo, uh, duo trios, so they could be playing with an extra player. So they're going to have to worry about every engagement. And sometimes a mistake people can make is they forget they're playing trios while they're playing in a duo. So that's what we're looking up here. They land, get looted. Get at least one gun that you're comfortable with so you can get enough money so you can get your loadout and then you can start full pressing teams. And this is generally the strategy of most aggressive players. Land somewhere they're comfortable, do a contract if you need to get the money, otherwise there should be enough on the floor. In this particular case, you could already see they're already at $7,000, $8,000. Um, so they're right at the edge of that amount that you need, which is $10,000 for that loadout drop. Then you pick up your weapon and then you full send, like I said, on those teams. A lot of times getting money for UAVs and then comboing that with the bounties because the bounty system will show a player regardless if they have ghosts or not. Whereas a UAV and even in advance can be very inconsistent um, even if you're wasting you know, all that money to get in the super UAV or the advanced UAV. So they've already looted. Looks like Super was a light drop, which isn't unheard of. Um, it just ends up being a light drop in this particular scenario because it's so far out the zone. Based off where they're at now, they're going to have to run pretty aggressively to get in the zone. So once they get this loadout, they got to take on a couple teams as quick as they can. But right around the time when the zone's going to start closing, they already need to make that transition. Um, so sometimes that can happen too. You're not always focused on where you're at in the zone. Got the armor satchel, running MP5 combo with the kilo, definitely good. A lot of times that's a good way to do it too because people running from storage, they're going to run through, jump through, get hit by the claymore, and they'll give away their clue. There's the UAV, and now they're going to full press. Odds are that these guys don't have loadouts, but they could potentially have loadouts. Got to worry about the other one that's closer, but obviously they, they don't have ghost downed easy kill. And the other part is there's good communication. If you're just looking to improve overall and you're more of a solo player, I'd recommend playing trio solos or random queue so you can at least get your loadout and then try and do your own thing or maybe communicate with those people. Um, or you could join the community Discord. There's a lot of people, different play styles, whether you're a little bit more patient, campy, if you're just a little bit more like want to get your win, kind of go through the flow, or you're super aggressive, you could party up with people that are like-skilled and like-minded so that you can end up with a chemistry that actually works because there's nothing worse than being an aggressive player and playing with people who like to camp and vice versa it's just you end up getting killed if you're the camper you're just more patient grabs a bounty it ends up working out that it's someone close so it works out really well see the other one he's giving the call outs say the other one behind this one looks more like a solo because odds are the the people don't have ghosts yet Almost a free kill, and he misses about one bullet. So that, that's one of the downsides that I've talked about before in the past with bounties is if they take them too long to get away or you have to chase them down, you lose out on the two minutes. Ideally, you want to knock out the bounty in the first minute and a half. And I think early game bounties can be really good because in case you guys didn't know, bounties are set up in a way that they want to make it so that it's fair, so it gets distributed. So it's almost like a lottery system that you can't win multiple times. So what will typically happen is you'll get a bounty on yourself and you won't get a bounty on yourself for the rest of the match. It works for everyone in the lobby as well. So he's got the high ground. He needs ammo here though. Able to clean up that team. The Kilo is definitely the, the top dog right now. A lot of people made the switch from the Growl. The other thing is the M13, which you can sometimes end up in ammo situations. But getting back to the bounty thing is uh, in the, the very beginning of the game, it's going to try and 
latch on to the closest person that hasn't had a bounty yet, which is pretty much everyone in the lobby. As the match goes on, people have had bounties on them and they've either died, came back from the gulag, or a combination of things they left or whatever. And the people that are left, most of them have had a bounty on their head. So it's gonna put you on the closest one that hasn't had a bounty. And if everyone in the lobby has had a bounty on their head, it's just gonna do that thing where it looks like it glitches out, where you grab the bounty and it kicks out a plate or, or whatever and some ammo or whatever the case is. That's the scenario is because the game doesn't want one particular player to feel abused, I guess, by having multiple bounties on their head. Um, so it's just something to be aware of. Um, early game, bounties could be, they're typically gonna be very close to you or the closest team to you. But as the match goes on, more often than not, the people near you have already had a bounty on their head. So they're already on the, they already got plenty of money. They're sitting at 30K. They went and cleaned up the bounty. They're still light on kills here. Four kills and they didn't really have the hottest drop because super was empty. They could have came out of there with maybe like three kills each if uh, two teams landed there and they got a couple kills each. So based off where they're at right now, there could be people who have ghosts right near them. Uh, but given the fact that the free loader hasn't dropped in, just coming through, going to clear out the building. There's obviously people down low. The UAV ran out, but this did give them a good idea of how many people to be aware of. Teammate calls in the UAV. Now he could push the guy on the buy. Teammate has the angle, giving the call outs. Oh, this guy was in the window. I didn't even see him. So let's go ahead and check that guy out. He is in the glass. You, you can see him right there. I guess you can see him. Oh, he was right there just timing. He just jumped through and the guy didn't even realize it. Good timing, I guess it works out. He's able to save his teammate. Thirst off the kill. There it is. And the other team is rotating over. You can see them rotating over from the hotel buildings. And then now you can gatekeep the bounty because they're rotating in over here at hangars. And usually the biggest difference between somebody getting high kills and somebody getting average kills is usually how aggressive you are pushing the next team, how loud you are, like just moving from place to place to place. Um, and you're not wasting a lot of time. Sucks they kind of missed out there. He's jumping off. He knows in a bad spot. Repositions. Another bounty. And look at how far it is. Since the team they've already had has the bounty, the other one's farther away. And that's just kind of how it ends up working because the team that's next to him already had a bounty and it ran out. So in this particular case, uh, some some teams, what they'll do is they'll get restock. It's sounding like he's going to get restock. Oh, nice couple easy kills. You'd be surprised at how, how good helicopter kills are. Looks like he got ghost, but it was hard to see. It's a little bit grainier. Poached. Nice. Easy money. See, they kind of got screwed a little bit in the momentum because the bounty that they should have got at hangers, they were unable to get. Damn, he snapped on him so quick. And that's the other part. There, there's certain things that you can work on and slowly improve on over time. Um, but if I'm being 100% honest, there's definitely... Some people, it's just different skill ceilings as well. Same thing like you see with sports. Not everyone's going to be a, a Michael Jordan or a Kobe Bryant or a Tom Brady or whatever sport you watch. No, not everyone is capable of being the top. There's always that top tier of people. Then there's some other role player, you know, some good starters, some role players, some people that ride the bench. And then some people that are like in the D League trying to come up and make it. Then there's amateurs. And then there's casual, you know. So there's all these different, you know, rec teams. So there's a various echelon of where people sit. Depending on how much time you invest in the game. Um, the, the natural inherent ability of the person. Whether it's just their reflexes are faster than the average person. Or maybe they're just a little bit smarter than the average person. So they think about things differently. Uh, there's a lot of different things that go into it, but that doesn't seem mean that hard work doesn't pay off because you can actually work on specific aspects of your game. So if you wanted to improve your accuracy, but you want to play on a higher sense, then maybe you you know you use some control freaks or something to raise the sense up a little bit. Maybe you just play at a higher sense longer until you get used to it, and you you just miss shots until you get better at handling that recoil, um, and that's definitely possible. 
The other part of it is, you know, maybe you work on strategy, where you should be positioning, where the rotations are happening, player movement, and that can come with just play time. Um, inherent just overall reaction time can improve slightly, but typically after a certain age, it starts to decline. So if you're like 40 years old watching this, you're probably not going to improve in that area. You're going to need to improve in the accuracy area, pre-aiming, positioning, outsmarting, you know, using the movement to your advantage um, in practicing the fundamentals. So whether that's in this game, it ends up being slide cancel, bunny hopping in every engagement when you're ADS. I mean, there's a lot of different things that you can improve on. You just have to identify what you can improve on, improve on those things, what your areas of weakness are, and improve on those things and identify maybe the things that you necessarily can improve on so that you can overcompensate in another area. Uh, typically though, if your accuracy is terrible, you just need to work on your accuracy. So they're probably going to go for this next bounty because they're just going from bounty to bounty to bounty. And that's one thing that's kind of changed with the, the four, a season four update. And even a little bit before that, they've kind of ruined the dynamic of the, the, uh, the contracts because there used to be a lot more scavengers around. So it was a little bit quick way to get your money. But in this particular case, it's, it's a little bit different. There's mostly bounties and the, the, the most wanted contracts, which I'm not really a fan of. I think there's way too many of them. See, like they're giving the call outs. There's a team rotating over there. They have the memory to know, okay, we saw the people rotating in. They might have ghosts now. Be on alert because there's probably someone going to be able to grab them. They grabbed another bounty. It wore off. Um, and they have the bounty on their head. So we'll see how close the threat gets. Usually a yellow threat means they're way out of range. Look at the reaction time there. They knew these people were rotating in. They teamwork. They did a, a swap out where he challenged the gate and get out of there. The person he's jumping in and the person inside the building thinks it's the same person that they've already damaged. So, you know, there's a little bit of a bait and switch. Um, some people will call it where basically one person took the damage and the other person might take the gunfight lightly on the other teammate. So sometimes it's good to wear the exact same outfit because then they won't be able to distinguish uh, who was actually damaged. So you use the precision there and the guy jumped out, I guess. What the heck was that? So they're in a good spot here. They have uh, money again, 16,000 cash. To go ahead and head to a buy station, they'll be able to get in here. They got about 30 seconds before the zone's going to start to collapse. They're not on the, uh, the the smallest side, but they're also not on the biggest side. Where they're going to have to rotate fast. This is a little bit of a slower zone, um, especially where they're at. Even though third third zone isn't all that fast to begin with, but this does give them plenty of time to make their rotation in and continue following the gas as people are coming in on this left side where they've already kind of marked where people are. You can see the guys on the other side of stadium. They're paying attention to that, but they're still going to push to where the gunfire is up this hill on the left, it looks like. Yeah, there's way more three to the left. And that's what what people do, too. You can see what he's talking about. He says, oh, I don't really care about the solo. Let's go ahead and push uh, where we can get. So they're splitting. So he's going for the solo real quick, and then it looks like the solo took off. And it ended up being two people. So they, as soon as you got a little bit closer, because the UAV only works to a certain range. If somebody's just outside that, you're not going to pick them up until you get a lot closer. And it's the opposite with the advanced. If, if somebody has ghosts, you won't see them as you get close. But as you're further away, they'll pop up as the triangle. So it's backwards. Um, it just needs to, the super UAV needs to work where it shows everyone. And there it is. So now they're going to have a split push. Um, he's already inside the zone. He could provide some cover for his team. He's not missing a bunch of shots using a metal weapon. Typically, that's what you want to do if you're going to use high kill games. You're not going to be using some random, hey, you know what? I'm testing out the the the, the FF. <laughs> I'm testing out the FAMAS today. Let, let me go ahead and try and get high kills. Maybe if you're a content creator trying to show off, you know, a, a gameplay or something like that. But in general, no one's running the FAMAS if you're trying to get some high kill games. It'll happen organically, but... Yeah, not not necessarily with that. So now he's got to cover his teammate while he gets the self-revive off. They're communicating whether he's going to be able to pull it off. He's trying to peek to see where these guys are. 
And that's sometimes tough about these areas. They're very hard to pick people off, especially if they're in the bush or whatever. And his teammates got to rotate in, and he's limited on space because there's a fence here. Comes in at the flank. That guy was still focused on the teammate, seeing if he can get an easy kill as he came through. And that's where the divide and conquer works um, because people can't really look at both angles and it allows you to have a flank, uh, especially if most teams are relatively together. If they're way too far spread apart, it doesn't always work because as soon as you come up, you kind of might have split the team. You shoot somebody and then there's another person behind you. So it, it gets a little bit wonky at times, but... You do this 10 times, you, you succeed maybe 5 or 6, 7. It, it really depends, but it's not going to be 100% foolproof. Nothing in a battle royale is because there's just inherent randomness of the zone, what people are going to do, how they're going to play, how they're going to take an engagement, how many of them are alive, how skillful are they compared to your skill, what weapon are they using. Like, there's way too many variables um, for something to work 100% of the time. That's why it's just... You know, you learn from experience and then maybe you handle a situation slightly better the next time you get into that situation. So I can guarantee, even though he's going to get over 20, 25 plus kills, almost a 30 kill game, what you'll notice is that probably he has failed several times before. Just like the same thing with the sports analogy. Obviously, you miss a bunch of shots. You you throw terrible throws. You drop terrible passes or whatever. You know, drop passes. You, you miss whatever sport you're into. You miss uh, on the mark. And that's why practice, practice, practice. And then that's where you could be at a disadvantage if you're really a casual. Because you just don't have the time to invest if somebody else is playing 6, 8, 10 hours a day versus two hours a day so you got to make sure that practice is quality practice and you're 100 percent working on those fundamentals to sure up those weaknesses so that as you get into these scenarios you can play more aggressive you can get a little bit better and it does help to play with a like skilled player for a couple reasons one is you're typically going to be on the same page as far as skill and play style um but on top of that with skill-based matchmaking if somebody is significantly better than the other and the lobby kind of averages out where they have a higher and low skilled players the person on the lower skill they're going to kind of have a hard time if they're only going against good people the entire time and the person that's really good maybe you know has a little bit of easy time with the lobby and that doesn't really make a good gaming experience for both players um Whereas if it was just random, some people would be good, some people would be bad, and you just play however. And if you're good, you're going to be able to go against some good players and sometimes bad, and it'll be a variety. But skill-based matchmaking kind of limits that variety um, if you're playing with friends. So now they have a money issue. It is getting kind of close where they're getting towards uh, the end zone. There's still uh, 10 teams left. Uh, with 20, what is it, 24 players, and he's already got 15 kills. So he's still going to get almost half of these kills that are left. And sometimes when it, when you are aggressive, what happens is sometimes you're running up against another team that is aggressive, and this is a perfect scenario. This is like exactly what you want. You want to go against a, a good team, and then once you eliminate them, the best team in the lobby, obviously it's still going to be good players, but you want to go against the best team in the lobby so you can wipe them, and then you're just cruising along. Um, versus maybe getting caught into a gunfight or getting in a bad scenario later on. You just want to be able to get rid of that that those players right away because there's typically, like, the top, even though skill-based matchmaking, the top percentage of the lobby is still the top percentage of the lobby. Because obviously with skill-based matchmaking, they can't get everyone from 150 players all with, like, 5 KDs if you're a 5 KD player. It just, you'd be in a lobby waiting forever. So he takes him out. There's another one on the right. His teammates got to revive, but he already used his self-revive. So he's just got to wait and kill that guy. He was able to see him. There he is. The last one. One shot. Perfect. And then now he's got to go revive his teammate. And that gets a little bit tricky because there was three of them. They had a good line of sight, but he was able to down one and then down the other. And by the other time he realized it, the guy that was communicating, he was able to snap onto the third. Uh, and they were running out of the gas, so they're a little bit distracted. He probably had a plate animation or a gas mask animation. There's a lot of variables of why those guys weren't aggressively shooting back. But uh, I would imagine that based off how many kills these guys had at the end, there's definitely, you know, there's sweats in this lobby. It's just a matter of how they were able to approach it, especially for playing low man with a two versus three. 
See, so there's two here that jumped out. They started firing probably a little too early. Um, because they kill these two and they're like, all right, that's it. It wasn't a team wipe. So they start running away. And luckily he's, he's better. He lost a couple plates there. His teammate probably would have still clutched it, but that was uh, pretty unfortunate. They kind of got a little bit lax in the situation, especially where you're low, man. And it just gets, it gets a bad time. You got to really count all the players. If you don't get team wipe, doesn't say it. You don't get any kind of audio cue. You you definitely got to be aware of that. So they're marking where they're going to run into people. There is somebody it looks like in front of him to the right. He's getting shot in the back, see? You can see where he was, but I think he assumed the other guy was just going to rotate in. And that guy is kind of a... It wasn't smart to shoot unless you're going to get the kill. See, you end up in a tricky situation here with the gas. Gas mask animations, plates. And you kind of screw it because there's if there's not a buy station left, you're not going to be able to buy back your team. So they should have waited, got a little bit closer, and then insta-deleted him. Where he didn't even have a chance to move, turn around. And then it would have been a 3v1 on his team. But those people, they got a little too aggressive, jumped the gun. If you're not going to get a kill when you're shooting somebody in the back, um, and they're going to be able to get to cover, come back, and, and angle on you, you don't know how good they are. Obviously, this guy's going to be a little bit above average, so he was able to shoot on him while his teammate was shooting the team shot so they can get out of there. But unless you know the person's just terrible, they're going to be able to get to cover, which he was able to do. So that person shot him just a hair too early, should have waited till the group was in there, kind of traced a little bit, and then shot him in the back. He would have insta-downed, could have thirsted, and then they would have been able to work the 3v1. So that was the mistake of the other team. And especially when it comes to late game, uh, you can see kind of how close they've stuck together. Even though they've been fairly close the entire match, one of the things, if you don't have money to get UAVs, um, you definitely need to stick close together because what will end up happening is you don't have enough intel to know where people are. So if you're solo, you, you basically need to get the first shot every single time. That's the only way you're going to continue like rolling through the lobby is getting the first shot, which allows you to, you know, which forces you to play a little bit safer and more passive, which isn't necessarily the route you want to go. So he's right outside the gas, has a gas mask animation. He does have a gas mask, so he's going to be fine. He went down again, but he's watching for him. They don't know he's here. They think he had a self revive or something. So he's able to catch him, gets the first shot. There's another one behind the tree. He didn't know exactly where he was. He thought he was a little bit further to the left because that's where the teammate was. And right here, here's the final 1v1v1. And a lot of times if you play low man, you can get in these scenarios. Um, but if it ends up being 3v1 or 3v3v1, you got to let those last people fight. Right here, he's just kind of find out where at least one of them are. Kind of pay attention to where they're at and maybe catch them off guard. You can hear him fighting. He's going to run and get some plates. Got a dead silence. Nice. 1v1. They fought out. You could hear him on the left side over here. Kind of directionally to the left. He does have a double stun here or a flash. It's kind of hard to sell, but the C4. Kilo 1v1. He's got 27 kills. So if he gets this, it'll be a clutch uh, 28 kill game. And like I said, these areas are tricky to fight in. Somebody could have worked around the, the top edge. You wouldn't be able to see them. They shoot you in the back. So, oh, there he is. He gave away his position with the snipe. He did hit a shot. Looks like he did 98-ish damage. So, he probably didn't hit a good shot. And the guy didn't have enough plates. He beamed him. Beamed him. So, pretty solid game. He ended up getting 28 kills. Uh, I think there was a lot to learn from that. How they played, how they rushed it. Obviously, not everything works out. And that's what you got to remember. Anyone posting these YouTube videos where they're getting 25, 28, 30, 35 kills. Every once in a while, they get dumpstered. They have several deaths back to back. They land and have trouble getting loot. It's not always this perfect scenario you see on YouTube. Just keep that in mind. Most of these people posting content, they are in the upper tier as far as content creators that are beasts. Like when we're talking about Husker, Swag, uh, and all those big names that, you know, Nick Merckx that are just absolute beasts at the game. 
They have those rough spots too, but they continue pushing a full accelerator. And when they get into the right situation, they start steamrolling the lobby, end up with a bunch of kills. It's kind of one of those things you, you don't know until you try. You got to shoot your shot, whatever you want to think about it. You know, you miss every shot you don't take or whatever. However you want to think about it, the only way you're going to play a little bit more aggressive, get more kills, is you have to actually be aiming to do that every single time because it's not going to fall into your lap most most of the time it's just not going to happen uh hopefully you guys did uh, enjoy the video learn something new if you did please remember to hit that like button if you're brand new want to find your way back for more call of duty content make sure you subscribe with notifications on if you're interested in joining the community discord to pair up with more people that's one of the top links down in the description and once you get in the discord make sure you check out that welcome section so you'll be able to jump right into matchmaking appreciate all the support on the content thank you for watching as always have a great day